Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, session on uh, the CFA program exam preparation. My name's Tom, I'm one of the uh, CFA program uh, trainers here at Fitch Learning, an accredited training provider by the CFA Institute. I'm going to give you a short lowdown, I guess, on uh, a couple of aspects of financial reporting and analysis. I guess geared towards you know, some of you guys out there that might be um, looking to do the examination in December. So, of course, the uh, examination is looming for you guys. Uh, and also, some of you might be just uh, looking to um, look into the CFA qualification, just maybe get a feel for some of the content that you might look to um, study towards the examination that would be for June next year. So, to kind of give you a, a kind of an awareness with where we're going to go in terms of an agenda, you know, I think these sort of sessions shouldn't go on too long. You know, I can't teach you the whole of accounts in the short space of time they've got available. So I just kind of you know, create a little bit of usefulness to go through just a couple of aspects of the accounting section. So we're going to look at non-current or long-term liabilities. Um, we're going to talk about um, a couple of aspects really. Uh, well, number one is going to be dealing with bonds payable. So we're going to deal with the um, issuance of debt from the issuer's perspective, uh, talking about the lease um, uh, um, accounting as well. Underneath there, we're number two. So really, it's a case of going through the long-term liability aspect of the accounts, which um, you know, generically, a lot of people often find quite tough. But uh, what I thought might be quite useful in the same sort of instance is to kind of show you that the calculator okay, that's prescribed for the CFA exam, the Texas BA2 Plus calculator, it's actually really quite a nifty piece of equipment because it's possible to do some of the bond accounting and some of the lease accounting um, on the amortization function of the calculator. So what I thought I'd spend a bit of time and kind of focus around would be the sort of amortization aspect of the calculator and how to um, effectively use it. Um, just before we do that, just a little bit with regards to um, Fitch Learning. Okay, of course, uh, we are an accredited training provider for the CFA program exams. Many, many years of, of, of kind of experience teaching towards the CFA program. Yeah, myself have been working here at Fitch Learning for nearly sort of 13 years, um, and also a few years um, beyond that working for uh, another accredited training provider. So yeah, we do have uh, many, many financial instructors that will be well versed in sort of CFA kind of program tuition, uh, which you guys will be kind of find useful in many different aspects, whether that's the classroom or also um, increasingly you know, a lot of people looking to do some of the online options. So you will find that uh, we do kind of cater for the many different aspects that people kind of want from sort of CFA program tuition nowadays. Uh, so flexible classroom courses and also online options we'll just talk about in a second. Now a lot of what we're obviously focusing on doing here is of course getting to grips with the CFA program syllabus. So a lot of that does come with um, interaction with obviously classroom environment, but also significant amount of kind of online study using, for example, our Fitch Learning Cognition platform, a um, really, really neat kind of uh, online learning platform that will be adaptive in nature. It will be very specific to your kind of strengths and weaknesses to kind of learn on uh, how you interact with the portal to kind of suggest where your strengths and weaknesses lie. So ultimately one of the key outcomes when you're using this Fitch Learning Cognition is to try and get through the material in the most efficient manner possible and the adaptive strategies that the portal takes on is a key kind of outcome that will be useful in your, your, your studies up towards the examination. Um, we'll find that there's um, a, a whole raft of different um, courses available. So talk about some of these in just a second whether it be online with the kind of portal or also kind of facilitating through a classroom review package, you'll find that we do have significant um, options available. And I'll see towards the end of this session, there's a, a contact point that if you wanted to um, send an email to some of our learning advisors, then you're more than welcome to kind of get into contact with them. Um, so just on that basis, like I said, the, the Fitch Learning Cognition Portal, you know, this is a, a new product for us where we, we kind of a lot of time resources gone into creating many, many different resources to kind of fit towards you know, CFA program delegates that um, vary you know, from their approach to CFA study. Some people like to kind of come in, um, you know, spend time going through a classroom environment, use the portal to kind of facilitate those classroom sessions. 
Um, other people might just take the, the kind of strategy to kind of study in their own time. So there's also the kind of full online learning pathway that will almost kind of lead you in a step-by-step -step process through video content and also through question practice and also mock exams. Everything that we do with the portal also comes with the relevant um, help that if you need it. We do have um, quite an obviously extensive um, help desk function that if you've got any issues with regards to some of the content you go through that you're not too sure on, you could always get support through the online port uh, platform where you can submit help desk queries to get any help with regards to uh, the CFA program syllabus as you progress. So the Fitch Learning Cognition will fit into pretty much um, any aspect of kind of uh, strategy that you take for the CFA program exam, whether that comes from number one, just kind of direct online learning. So the Fitch Learning Cognition portal will essentially give you lots of content in the basis of videos broken down into kind of bite-sized pieces that will master what we call the learning outcome statements for the syllabus. That will also be facilitated with significant question practice that will also facilitate the video content you go through. Um, some people from an online perspective still like to have the kind of, if you like, structure of the classroom environment. So what we do um, do in each of our sittings leading up to December and also for June, for example, for level one and also for levels two and three for the June sitting is we will record a classroom environment so that people can dial into the classroom sort of on a live basis to kind of sit in and watch the tutor go through the content. So some people may be looking for a little bit more structure may find the online portal with the live webcast really quite useful. Um, some people, of course, might want to kind of just facilitate having kind of gone through some of the syllabus on, in their own time, want just to kind of bulk up getting closer to the examination. So we do provide kind of an online review kit and also a two-day classroom review course. It's going to be geared towards, I guess, a little bit more of question practice, sort of debriefed by the tutor and then teaching around the kind of subject, subject matter. So you'll find that the review courses will also be there to facilitate some people that might have studied themselves. Um, other people might just want to bolster with questions. So there's a question bank option that we have that gives you access to thousands of questions. We can almost build your own sort of mini tests to get the question practice that's really important for the CFA program. And then also what's really, really important as you get close to the examination is that you try and structure um, you know, sitting mock exams under sort of time conditions. So we do have uh, a proctored mock exam you can kind of take in a physical presence and also available through the online system as well. It is really important that as you get close to the examination, you kind of deal with the structure of the examination, get used to your kind of strategy, apply your knowledge, and that's really important to try and sit it under those sort of time conditions of two, three hour papers for the six hour, of course, exams that you have on the Saturday in December or June as it may be. So that's a little bit about the um, some of the courses that we do provide. Like I said, is that I'll put down a point of contact later on with some emails, but depending upon uh, the location that might suit you, you can obviously contact if you need to get any further discussion on some of the courses and also the online content that we provide. So I was asked to kind of come in and say, Tom, can you cover uh, financial reporting and analysis? Well, the first thing that I would say to you is that it is a big bulk of the examination. So the current weighting would be 15% uh, of the exam. And for a lot of people coming into the CFA program, for the many, many years of experience that I've had in teaching towards the CFA program qualification, it is probably the one area that a lot of delegates do, um, I guess, struggle with to a certain extent. Um, people aren't necessarily from an accounting background, so it is quite a steep learning curve and quite daunting. So to kind of give you a view on that 15%, remember that the CFA program is broken down into many subsections. These are called study sessions. So you'll actually find on uh, this page and also the next, okay, you've got uh, four study sessions for the accounting section. Uh, at this stage, you know, I think for a lot of people that are you know, looking to take the examination December, can um, kind of move through the content if you've already seen it in study session six, which is very much an introduction, getting used to the kind of interaction of the balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, for example, where you'll find that the big bulk of the material in terms of the kind of where it ramps up in difficulty is probably stuck with study session seven, and I would say here eight in particular. So just to kind of give you a bit of a guideline before I start kind of going into specific content for this session, um, understanding the income statement becomes quite a specific kind of task in itself. You know, things that kind of stand out to me there to make sure that you're able to master would be, for example, some of your earnings per share calculations. 
whether they be uh, diluted anis per share uh, or what we call basic EPS or basic anis per share. So the idea that we have dilution that's possible from certain instruments in the company like convertible bonds, it could be stock options and warrants and so on. So it's really kind of getting to grips with a few calculations in there. The balance sheet, I guess, is kind of centered around what stands out to me is the accounting of financial assets under kind of current CFA terminology, for example, available for sale, trading securities or held to maturity, thinking about whether or not they get held at a fair value. If they are fair value, if there are gains and losses, you know, how do we account for those gains and losses? Pretty much in words rather than numbers themselves. So understanding the balance sheet actually in greater detail, I think, is a big focus of study session eight. We will look at inventories, long-lived assets. We look at, for example, long-term liabilities in the context of the balance sheet. So you actually get a lot of that content found from study session eight in particular. Understanding cash flow statements, not always a fan for most people taking the CFA program exams. You're starting with a number like net income, which you collect from the income statement, and your, your job is trying to reconcile to cash flow from operations. So learning some of the intricate details of you know, how you go from net income to CFO would be a key outcome when it comes to uh, that particular reading there, which is the cash flow statement. Then, not to forget, okay, we've got here ratios. We've got ratios, more ratios, have some more, why not have some more, a big, long list of ratios, and everyone's like, oh, how am I going to remember those? Well, reality is not everyone does, and that's probably a normal feeling for, I think, for a lot of people coming into study session seven. But what I would say to you is that how you should think about a lot of the ratios is probably through their actual application. I'll give you a few tasters later on when we look at the lease accounting, for example, because you'll find that the general kind of same ratios seem to kind of pop up again and again and again in their application to FIFO, LIFO, um, accelerated versus straight line depreciation, operating leases, capital leases. So I think you learn a lot of the ratios by their application that you see here in study session eight. So for example, inventory, your choice of FIFO, LIFO to account, for example, your cost of goods sold with inventory has an impact on ratios. Long-lived assets, property, plant and equipment, your straight line versus some form of accelerated depreciation has an implication on ratios X, Y, Z. Okay, you've got non-current or long-term liabilities. So for example, your choice in lease accounting has an impact on ratios X, Y, Z. So a lot of the ratios, like I said, you'll learn through their application right so a lot of the content we use in the review class is to kind of show you know key for example reading some of the key content in there and in the accounts naturally you find we kind of provide little summary diagrams of what will be the impact on certain ratios by your accounting choices uh, reading 29 not everyone's favorite as well this is dealing with the world of deferred taxes we really suggest that it can be really useful if you can get hold of looking at a piece of video content, which you'll find on our portal, of course, for deferred taxes. You'll find that can be really useful because it's one of those topic areas that sometimes you kind of need someone to kind of read you uh, the bedtime story, a borderline kind of a horror story, where you just need to be explained deferred tax in just simplistic terms. Because I think sometimes you can kind of read it yourself, it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. It's a bit like derivatives at level two, you try and read it on your own, you really, really sometimes find it quite difficult. So I think with deferred tax in particular, it can be quite useful to kind of get some of the video content there just to kind of go through some of the key aspects and actually starts to make a little bit of sense. And then I, I kind of generally feel in classes that people go through study session eight and they're kind of going, oh, I'm reaching saturation point now. I can't physically take any more accounts. I've had enough of it. And I'm saying, like, well, don't panic. Study session nine is kind of a breath of fresh air because really there's nothing necessarily new content as such because it's showing an application of all the bits you've seen um, precursor to that. So in study session eight in particular, because you know management might have choices to make about you know what accounting policies they choose, and that can help maybe boost profits. Now um, they can be quite aggressive in the way they're showing their um, practices, or they could be quite conservative. So a lot of discussion about um, earnings quality, some of the choices that managers make, whether they be legal or illegal, kind of deals within the major bulk of nine, which is their reading 31 financial reporting quality. So a little bit of an application in 32 through the uses of financial statement analysis for sort of credit um, analysis. Could also be for sort of screening stocks for potential inclusion to a portfolio. Quite a small one there on 32 
31 to me seems the bulk of study session nine. So that's kind of giving you a flavor for some of the content to the accounts. So I guess what we're going to do is focus, like I said at the moment, just very quickly on non-current liabilities. Now, you've got to remember is that the reality is, is that to teach this properly, you know, I could be easily here for the next three hours going through the finer details of bond accounting and lease accounting. Well, that's not going to be useful to anyone because you've always got that on the online portal. But you know, just to kind of give you a little kind of few nuggets to kind of say, well, what could be tangible bits we can take from this short session that we might actually find quite useful? Well, number one, it's kind of an assumption here, is that I always say with delegates, you know, you, you think about, um, you know, for example, we teach accounts quite early on in the course because it's the big elephant in the room. A lot of people worry about it. it's a big topic area. And you need to kind of learn quite fast. So you're starting off with the accounting section is where we generally go. And then we start moving into areas like asset classes, fixed income, for example, and equity. And I always kind of say in classes that once you've gone through areas like fixed income in particular, you know, think back to bits you've gone through in accounts and sometimes you kind of take the collective of both fixed income and accounts together, you start to make bridges across the syllabus it's to a point where you get towards the latter end of your studies, then you're kind of using similar concepts such as time value of money, but just shown in different applications like portfolio management. So naturally with what I've kind of just put a box around there, you know, the idea that bonds can trade at a discount to their par value bonds can trade at a premium to their par value. You know, in fixed income is kind of fundamentally related to the yield on the bond, right? So also known as the market rate right? or the yield to maturity, which if you think about it is the investor's sort of required rate of return uh, relative to the coupon rate, which is the income being generated by the bond itself. And obviously the yield to maturity is going to be a function of the riskiness of the issuer when they decide to issue bonds. And that's the return to the investor, of course, and it's going to be the cost to the issuer. So what we're going to do is look at the liability, you know, the bond issuance, we're looking at the cost that the issuer incurs, which of course would be the return to the investor. So you can naturally see the overlap with this from fixed income, where we're very much from the investor perspective, to here accounts, which is obviously from the issuer perspective. Now, point is, is that if um, a coupon on a bond is offered to the market at a rate which is quite low relative to the required return, which is the market rate, the concession is that investors are prepared to pay less in price. So that's why it's trading at a discount. You think about your time value of money and how you price bonds, you'll find that it's kind of mathematically the case that if the market rate's high, yield to maturity is high, coupon rate's low, then the bond naturally trades at a discount. Of course, if it's a premium, then we're saying, well, actually, the opposite way around, we offer a high coupon relative to the required return of the market rate, in which case, there's no free lunch. Just means that if you've got a higher coupon, you pay more for it and you pay a premium above par. Now, this is where the accountants get a little bit stressed out because if you think about it from an accountancy perspective, right, you might notice this diagram again from fixed income, nominal value or the par value of the bond. You know, it could be, for example, let's say 1,000, which is the par value of the bond. Um, and that's what's going to be paid back on the maturity date. So if you imagine this is like the passage of time, we're going to walk towards maturity. And of course, what the company will do is it will owe the bondholders 1,000 on a maturity, which it will need to pay out of its cash balance. The problem is, though, is that when the bond is first issued at the date of issuance, okay, the accountancy treatment is very simple in that if you think about their balance sheet, so assets are equal to equity plus liabilities, is that the company will receive cash, okay, and they will offset that with a bond payable or a bond liability, if you like, and that the two will balance, right? The issue you've got is that the cash proceeds will reflect what the price of the bond was when it was issued, which can be a discount or it can be a premium. So. We've got their cash coming through the door to reflect the bond that's being issued. And that could be, for example, just make up some numbers, 980. That means it's issued a discount to the par value. Now, the problem that the accountants are going to face is that it knows that on maturity, what needs to happen is that the company needs to pay back the nominal value. And it's currently showing a liability of 980. That means that the liability in the balance sheet is too low needs to be a thousand ready for redemption to then use cash to pay down the liability of a thousand. So what we're going to do is through an accountancy trick almost is increase the liability on each balance sheet date. We are going to offset that by making equity full, okay, by playing around with the interest expense that you observe, right, in the interest in the sorry in the income 
statement. So effectively what you're going to do is liabilities will rise, equity falls by increasing the interest expense by a non-cash adjustment, which for a bond which is trading at a discount would be a non-cash addition to the interest expense to make equity fall. You'll also have on the other side of that, that's the um, amortization of bond discount on one side of your interest expense, which is non-cash. The other side is being matched by the fact that the company periodically pays a coupon, spends cash, so its assets go down. That also forms part of the interest expense. So you've actually got the cash component of that, uh, which makes up the interest expense in total. So the point is, is that you've got two mitigating components of the interest expense. You've got the cash coupon and then the non-cash element, which is the amortization of discount. Now, if you think about the diagram that I've just drawn here, just draw as a straight line, make it nice and simple. We're saying that on each balance sheet date, what needs to happen is the liability needs to go up by a process which is a non-cash amortization effect and that's referred to as the amortization of discounts. So slowly what's going to happen is the liability is going to increase. And the sort of things that you're going to be required to do for the exam would be to identify if it was a calculation, what the balance sheet liability for the bond issuance might be, the end of year one, year two, year three, and so on. What the interest expense is that goes through the income statement, you know, and what might be the change in the liability you know, what's that? That's the amortization of the bond discount. And the good news is that once you get that kind of bigger picture, you can start relying on the use of the calculator to kind of get key components with regards to all of that accountancy just through the use of the calculator itself. Now, the general consensus of what we're going to do, I'm going to show you an example in a minute. We're going to go through some numbers using the calculator. But the big picture is, is that if you wanted to reconcile the liability in a balance sheet from one balance sheet date to the next, then we're effectively taking the liability at the start of the period. The liability will have an interest cost, which is going to be based upon its value at the start, multiplied by the interest rate, which are the bonds yield to maturity. And then that will cause your liability to grow by interest. You'll see in a bit that the calculator will have um, an interest you know, calculation that you can pull off from the amortization, just kind of pull off the number. The company will service this through the payment of the coupon. So I'm going to put their payment as the bond coupon. That's the cash outflow that the company spends to service the bond. And then that will get you your liability, which will be present at the end. And that's like a balance sheet linkage. You can go like year one, year two, year three, year four, and keep going. Well, that can take a lot of time. So you can use the calculator to effectively pick out the interest, INT, to pick out what we call the balance, B-A-L for the balance, which is the liability at the end of the year, and also the change in the liability, which is almost like going up that you know, um, pull to redemption through time, which will be the amortization effect. So we're going to find this really several things we're going to pick from the calculator, balance, interest, and then also the amortization effect. Now, to kind of show you an example just very quickly, yeah, we've taken a little example from our slide pack, which is bond issued at a discount. The first thing we should note, the fact that it is trading at a discount, is not because it says so at the top and it's a bond at a discount, but we could naturally pick out that the coupon rate on this bond is 8%. The market interest rate on the bond, which is the yield to maturity when the bond is issued, is 9%. So we're using some form of historic amortized cost application for bond accounting means that because the coupon rate is low and the yield is high this mathematically will trade at a discount so what we can do is two things really is that we can use as if by magic here we can use the calculator the BA2 plus for the CFA ex uh, program exams we can use the TVM function right so if you look on the third row You've got NIY, PV, payment, and FE on my calculator. If you've got the kind of newer version of this, just aesthetically just looks a bit different, you've got a white strip of buttons with your TVM buttons. And what you can do is assign the features of the bond to solve for its price, which is PV. And if you take this bond here, it's got, um, first of all, a lifespan of three years. So we assign three as N. The IY is the interest rate or the yield on the bond, which is 9%, 9RY. The payment of 3200 on the basis of the coupon rate, the coupon rate is always expressed as an annual percentage of the nominal value, 
nominal value is also known as face value. That's the principal that will be paid back at the end. If it's at 8% of 40,000, you've got 3,200 as the coupon payment. The return of the principal comes back at the end. You've got the bullet repayment of the 40,000 at the end of the life of the bond. If we then ask the calculator to compute the present value, then you can work out the bond price. So if I just quickly just show you of my calculator, here we've got a bond. It had a maturity of three years. So number first, three, select M. We then go to the IY. You can see that the, the market rate is 9%, 9 percent, nine IY. The 3,200 was the payment. And then I've got the um, 40,000, which is the return of the principal at the end. And then I can ask the calculator top left to compute, compute the present value. And you can see there that the bond is issued at a discount 38,987. Therefore, reflects the fact that this would be the issue proceeds. This would be the cash received for that bond issuance. And what we're going to try to do is account for the fact that over a period of time, that the bond liability would grow up towards 40,000 ready for redemption. The company pays down or pays off the debt by spending 40,000 in cash and then the liability of 40,000 then disappears as if by magic you've accounted for the bond issuance. So to kind of show that I guess is that you can go from scratch. We said the liability in the balance sheet will start, grow, by interest. The interest expense will be on the basis of the liability at the beginning of the period um, multiplied by the yield to maturity on the bond. So it's the liability at the start of the respective period plus interest. This is just for year one. It will be serviced by the coupon payment and then that will give you your liability at the end of year one. That will repeat for year two. Liability at the end of year one opens for year two, grows by interest, reduces by payment to get liability, end of year two, and so on. So with the um, use of the calculator, if you like, if I just do the first, second row, let's do the second row, um, uh, I guess, from scratch, if you like. We take the opening liability for year two because it grew by interest, 3509, serviced by 3200 to give 39296 that closing balance for year one is opening for year two. Your interest expense would be 39,296 times the rate of 9%. Just check that on my calculator and then that will give me the interest expense for year two. So 39,296 times 0 0.09 gives me a, an interest cost which is 3,536.64. So we can therefore then service that through uh, the coupon payment, which is going to be a reduction of 3,200 for the cash coupon, and therefore give me a closing liability, which is 39,633. Now, given that um, I had the calculator, what I did is I put the bond into the calculator, I sold for the unknown, which is the price. In the, in the background of the calculator, what it's now doing is using an amortization function. If you look at the second button, which is on the uh, second row to the left-hand side, you get access to the secondary functions of each of the buttons on the calculator. And if you look at the PV button, you see just above that in orange is an amort or amortization function. So if I press second and an amort, this will then allow me to, to actually engage in the use of the amortization function of the calculator. So I have also put a slide on here just to kind of show you exactly the button presses I'm about to go through. So it was second and then amort. And then what we're going to do is isolate a particular period of time. So P1 means the start of that respective period. P2 means the end of that respective period. And if I'm setting P1 as 1 and P2 as 1, you're encapsulating basically year 1 from P1 start to P2 finish. If you wanted to select year 2, then it would be P1 of 2 and P2 of 2 to again encapsulate basically year 2. So you're going to find that what we can do is identify the balance, the interest, right? So the balance is the liability at the year uh, end. Um, interest is the interest expense that goes through the income statement. The PRN here is actually the change in the liability. Uh, and in the context of bonds, this represents the amortization effect or the bond discount 
or that of premium. So if that's the year one data, for example, and we should be able to reconcile the data that we see. So I'll tell you what, if I put the calculator back up and let's just show you, just go back to CEC if you want to follow me. Second, I'm pressing PV for AMOT and I've set P1 as one at the moment. By, by default, it's always one anyway. If I scroll down, that's on the top line, there's a down arrow, press the down, P2 says one, so I've got year one data. If I then scroll down, you see balance 39296 is the number that you see there highlighted in yellow. That's the balance at the end of year one. If I go down, the PRN, about 309, if you looked at the difference between 38987 and 39296, the change in the liability is the idea that because it was issued at a discount, then it's going to go up closer towards the nominal value by an amount which is 309 for the first year. And then if I go down just once more, interest, you'll recognize that number. That's 3508.87 or 3509 rounded, which is year one interest expense. So really useful to have to pick out the relevant years. And if I wanted to reconcile, for example, let's say um, year two, then I go back to P1 because I want year two now, I, want, I press two. That's the start of year two. Enter the store, top line. Press the down arrow, go to P2, press two, enter. I've now isolated year two data. I scroll down, you see the balance, 39,633. And if I go down again, you've got principal, it's a change in the liability of 39,296 to 39,633. Again, just showing you the amortizations, the fact that the bond is increasing in liability over that period of time. If I go down once more, the interest expense there, you'll see 3536.67 or 64 I had given the rounding. So the idea of the member. The idea of the um, discount is the bond was issued at a discount. It was going to roll up, if you like, towards the maturity date over time. And that what we're trying to reflect here is that slowly what's happening is the liability is changing. It was issued at 38,987. And then we've got a balance sheet liability, end of year one, end of year two, and then end of year three. And you see there that what's happening it's going from 39, uh, sorry, 38,987 to 39,296, from 39,296 to 39,633, and then from 39,633, you're going to find, like this, if we get out our data for the um, year three, if I go P1 of three and P2 of three, I'll have an interest expense of about 3,566.97. Your fund, you obviously paying down with the bond coupon payment, which will get you close to 40,000, which is ready for redemption. And remember that the change in the liability in each of those balance sheet dates would reconcile by the change in the liability in each of the respective rows. And that's the amortization effect, which is the PRN on the calculator to show the fact that the bond gets closer to maturity. Um, as uh, the bond gets towards maturity, it rolls up. If it was a premium bond, it goes the other way, and then the amortization effect goes in completely the opposite direction, and the liability basically falls. So it's just allowing to kind of visualize a little bit, but requiring kind of, I guess, the use of the calculator to effectively do that for you. Now, the, the, the other thing I thought I'd just kind of finish off on just very quickly, of course, is the idea that we can use exactly the same context in the kind of leasing world. Because in the world of leases, you've got um, basically two forms of accounting. And the, and the leasing sort of, um, I guess, regulation has changed in real life. Um, the CFA syllabus is kind of a transitionary period at the moment where a lot of the focus is on US GAAP, where there's still a difference between the fact you can have an operating lease where effectively you just use an asset. You don't reflect that asset on your balance sheet and you just enter into some sort of um, payment every year, cash down, and it's expensive through the income statement. So an operating lease is, is kind of the dream, really, from the kind of exam perspective. It's very easy just to expense cash down and put it through the income statement, whereas the financing lease is a little bit more reality, saying, well, if you lease the asset for a significant period of time, which under US GAAP has some specific numbers, which it might be worth just trying to you know, think about, is that if that's for at least 75% of the asset's life, then that's actually a criterion to recognize it as a finance, what we call a capital lease. And that means that what you're going to do, it's a big picture, is on your balance sheet is you're going to show, first of all, a piece of PP&E 
that you've effectively taken on and used for a significant proportion of its life and you financed it by entering into a leasing arrangement which is like an accounts payable, it's like a lease payable, that's a liability. And the liability and the asset offset one another to kind of keep the balance sheet in check and the balance sheet balances. So again, what you're going to have to do in the exam, if it's a calculation possibly, is to try to reconcile the change in the liability from one balance sheet date to the next. And again, you're thinking, okay, well, I've seen this in bonds. I see the overlap. We can use the amortization of, you know, kind of function of the calculator to do that for us. So IFRS is kind of really simplified in the syllabus in the sense that they now say, look, if any lease extends beyond a period of 12 months, then effectively what's going to happen is going to be treated as a capital lease and therefore brought to the balance sheet. So there's no real kind of distinction, the fact that you've got operating where the asset doesn't come to the balance sheet versus the capital lease where it does. Now, the, the general treatment of the um, lease liability, again, I'll show you an example with the calculator in just a minute, follows a similar analogy to the bonds. You have your liability at the beginning of the period. So call that start, if you like. That's going to grow by interest. And the interest is going to be on the basis just above it. The interest will be on the basis of your opening liability for the year times the rate implicit on the lease. So that would be your interest expense. And that's going to cause your liability to rise. But then what the company does is it services that interest by making a payment. It's like a mortgage. And if you make that payment in excess of the interest that's accrued, you actually pay down on the debt. And that's the paying off of the principal, the PRN, a bit like the amortization effect on a bond, in which case you get to your liability, which is then present at the end of the respective year. So very similar. And that means, therefore, what we can do is just show the amortization effect. And I might also just also just try to reconcile, which I often find some delegates get wrong, is kind of you know, profitability on operating versus capital lease uh, in the context of early in the latter years of the lease's life. So just to show you an example, right? Um, we've got here a four-year leased asset, right? So it could be, um, let's say, a car, whatever it might be. You're making 1,000 in payments every year. The rate implicit is 10%. The economic life is five years of the asset. So you could actually say, well, have I met the criterion? Because I'm leasing it for four out of its five-year life. Yeah, that equates to a percentage, which is 80%. 80% is above the minimum requirement, which is 75% or more of the asset's life. So therefore, it meets the criterion to be um, under US GAAP, technically a capital lease. But again, I think, you know, chances are we should be told to say this is either a capital or an operating lease. Um, and we, we've got, well, what we'll do is accounted for it as a financing lease because that's the more interesting one. But what we can do is say, well, what would be at the outset, if you like, the lease liability that's recorded? So you've got this liability. And also, what will be the asset, the PPE that you record? So that's just going to be the present value of the lease payments you're going to make. It's a bit like an annuity. You've seen that in, in quantitative methods, for example. So what we're going to do is put in the features of the lease using the time value of money function. Four-year lease, four as N. You've got 10 as IY. You've got 1,000, which is the cash payments you're making under the lease obligation. You're going to owe nothing at the end. It's not like a bond where you pay off the nominal value. So you owe nothing at the end, so zero future value. And then what you're going to ask the calculator to do is compute the present value of all of those lease payments. You'll find 3,170. All right. Now, last couple of bits I'll just show you just very quickly, right, is that if that, therefore, represents the present value of your lease payments, right, then we just say, OK, let's go to an amortization table. That 3,170 now sits as a liability. 3170 in the balance sheet, lease payable, and you're going to have an asset which is 3170 as PPE. And what you'll do is you'll depreciate the asset, and because you've got an asset, you brought that to the balance sheet, and you're also going to show the reconciliation of the liability. So we'll just deal with this slide here. This is the liability only, right? The liability in the respective period starts, grows by interest. 10% in this case, so 3170 grows at 10%. 10% of 3170 is 317. You service by making a lease payment. 
that's in excess of the interest that's accrued of 317. So the difference between 1,000 and 317 is paying down on liability. That's the principal repayment to get your liability at the end of the respective period. And if you keep whizzing through, you got there for, remember, 10%. 10% of roughly, let's say, 2490 will be interest of 249. So all a bit of rounding here. Reduced by 1,000 to give you a closing liability end of year two, 1736. 1736 roughly begins in year three, grows by roughly 10%, let's say roughly 174, gets serviced by 1,000 to give roughly 910. 910 opens for year four by 10% is roughly 90, just give or take on the rounding, and then down by the 1,000, you therefore got basically zero left at the end, and then the balance has been paid off over the life, which is four years. It's like paying off your mortgage over its 25-year life. So again, the nature of the calculator, which is really nifty, just means that what we can do is we can reassign values. We said that we got the lease liability, which is set out on the calculator, four as N, 10 is IY. We've got a payment of 1,000 being made, zero future value owed at the end, compute PV, that's your 3169 or what I said was 3170. So if I want to reconcile what effectively would be the um, balance sheet liability, so BAL for example, second, and an AMOT, I can choose a respective year. So for example, I'm set at P1 of 2, so I'm looking at year 2 data for the moment. Year 2 data, P2 of 2, to encapsulate year 2 data, scroll down, balance, 1736, which is on the end of the second row there. That's your balance sheet liability for the lease obligation end of year 2. If you scroll down, the PRN will be the reduction of the liability from 2487 at the start of year 2 to 1736 at the end of year 2. So that's the reduction of your liability. That's called the principal. And then you've got that interest. The interest expense will be 10% of the opening liability of 2487, which is roughly 249. You see there, 248.69 to be precise. So you can always just pick off the relevant year to then get your bond accounting. Now, what I'm going to just do just very quickly at the end, right, just to show that the, the end, the last bit of this, that's the liability. Now you're going to find that when you put interest into this, the liability grows by interest, take year one of 317, that interest will be expensed through the income statement, all right? So you've got um, income statement, expenses, right? Well, the first one you're going to have is 317, which is attached to the interest, okay? But what you've got to remember is that you've also shown a piece of PP&E at the start, which will be worth 31. 70 because that offsets obviously the liability on one side you've got the asset on the other and that's pp and e what we're going to do is depreciate that straight line over the lease life of four years straight line to salary value let's say of zero nice and simple 3170 divided by four means that we've got approximately 793 of depreciation if you think about that 793 of depreciation how do we account for depreciation we expense it through the income statement to reconcile the reduction in the asset. And if you take those two together, so the 793 plus the 317, then that's a total in income statement expense of 1,110. Now, the reason I want to show you this is that that is the, the expense in total through the income statement for the capital or this financing lease. And if this was just an operating lease, great little slide just to kind of finish off with here, is that you'll notice that the operating expense that you would put through the income statement as a lease expense would just be the same 1,000 cash payment you're making every year. No other accountancy treatment other than just to expense, expense, expense through the income statement like that, right? And we just said a second ago, the total income statement expense under a capital lease is 1,110. That's that number there. It's made up of two components. You've got the interest and the depreciation, which if you combine the two, 793 and 317, 
So the 1,110 as an expense free income statement is greater than the 1,000 expense. So therefore, which of these two policies is going to create a lower profitability in that first year? Well, financing lease has a greater expense, therefore lower profits. Therefore, if you go back and reconcile what we saw before, just a quick one, when you look at the early years, that's year one, capital lease will have a lower profit than that of an operating lease because the capital lease of the depreciation interest combined is in excess of the operating lease expense that you find. However, look at the relationship with that is that the amount of interest that goes through, so the amount of interest that goes through the income statement gets smaller because of course the liability gets paid down. 10% of an opening liability was getting smaller means the amount of interest you pay in absolute terms gets smaller, less goes through the income statement. So you actually find in the latter years, can you see that the 1,000 in year three and year four operating expense is now greater than what the financing lease is. So it actually reverses the other way. We therefore find that the operating lease versus the capital lease in the latter years or the later years of the um, lease's life reverses around. If you actually take the total over the four-year period, you find that 4,000 is expensed under finance, 4,000 is expensed under operating, and they are effectively the same. All right, so very, very quick to kind of go through and mention, but of course, that's just a quick overview to some of the lease accounting. But I think the key outcome at this stage, because you might be trying to think, well, it's a long time since I looked at the accounts, I barely remember what we did, but you've got to remember that the calculator is your friend for this exam and that there will be instances where it can do a lot of the legwork for you. And I guess it's just getting to grips with what some of those calculator functions are. So, of course, on the cognition portal that we've got, we do provide an extensive library that shows you um, lots of snippets of videos of the different aspects that the calculator has to deal with, for example, depreciation to deal with amortization, sort of statistics like standard deviation and so on. And a lot of that actually can be really helpful for the examination, which means that you don't necessarily need to memorize long formally and it helps you to kind of speed up as well. So hopefully you find that kind of useful and it's kind of a blend between trying to make an assumption you've done a little bit of work, but also just trying to make it useful to kind of show, well, even if you've done a bit of work, maybe you'll find the, the, the calculator function quite useful as well. So a little bit of a blend there to kind of give you a little kind of um, kick towards the examination or maybe a thought that you might decide to take this examination in June of next year. So what I've done there is kind of left a few learning um, kind of contact points there. We've got some learning advisors more than happy to talk to you. You've got the Americas, Asia Pacific, Europe and the Middle East. Feel free to kind of contact with regards to either telephone or email. Hopefully you find this session useful. If I don't see you in the ether of the internet on the online portal or in a classroom environment, then good luck for the uh, examination if you decide to take it. And thanks for taking the time to listen. Thank you very much. Well, good.